Hello Kickstarter, I hope you are sitting there contemplating or have already contemplated and feeling satisfied about giving money to this amazing project that we're about to do together, right? You and me, um, make an adventure game. And uh, one of the first things I like to do is just talk to people and kind of get my thoughts out and their thoughts and find out what kind of um, uh, wisdom we can put together about uh, adventure games. One of my uh, people I like to talk to is Ron Gilbert, especially in this case because he was like the Gandalf of adventure games, you might say, old and, and crabby, and he um, knows a lot about them. Uh, he was my first boss. He um, was one of the people who hired me at LucasArts and uh, picked me to work on his Secret of Monkey Island game. And, um, and he was a mentor to me early on in my career, and so um, taught me a lot of important things, so I want to see if he can uh, teach me some more. It's been a long time since we made adventure games together, or made them at all, and so I want to talk about you know, why that is and what adventure games meant to us then and what they could mean to us now. And so um, he has very strong opinions and uh, uh, I'm sure he'll be willing to share them with us. So let's go see. Ron Gilbert. Ah, don't use this part. So uh, my question first, did you play adventure games before you made adventure games? Uh, yes, I did. Really? Which I one? did, but mostly the text adventures. Uh -huh. I think the, the, the one game that really got me excited about adventure games was the original adventure that was on the mainframe computers. But those were like the very first text adventures, and those are ones that I played and absolutely loved. I didn't really play a lot of graphic adventures, you know, until Maniac Mansion. It's a habit to call them graphic adventures, but they're only called graphic adventures because they're text adventures that had like. Right, we don't call them, them graphic first person shooters. No. Right, Unless just... they're extremely graphic. <laughs> um, well, I suppose that is another way. I played a lot of like Scott Adams adventures on my Atari. This pirate one. He, you say, oh. Um, That's where I stole the idea Yo from Monkey Island. Did you? <laughs> You've got like three origin <laughs> stories from Monkey Island. Um, he wrote a column for Softside Magazine called Say Yoho, which was like an important command you had to type in, because you only type nouns and verbs in that game. Mm -hmm. You were just trapped in the, in the everyday apartment that he starts in, and then you say Say Yoho and you're teleported. But I never, the only reason I figured out the puzzle is I read it in a magazine. And back there, that was totally fair game to like have a puzzle that you had to look up or that. What are magazines? Exactly. And <laughs> also Infocom games like Zork and uh, Deadline, the mm -hmm. murder mystery one. Remember? And Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, I played the, I played the Infocom one with Zork. There was also a pirate Infocom one. There was a pirate yeah. Infocom? Yeah, it was uh, Plundered Hearts. <laughs> Sounds like a romantic one. Well, it's actually an interesting story because uh, Plundered Hearts was uh, designed and written by uh, this woman, Amy Briggs, mm -hmm. and uh, she was my babysitter. <laughs> what? I swear to God. She, <laughs> she lived across the street from me. You stole the idea from Monkey Allen from your babysitter? Yeah, that's... That's my fourth origin story from Monkey Island. <laughs> yeah, she lived across the street from me, and when I was like in fifth grade or something, she was like uh, three or four years old or so. Like she was babysitting you one night when a meteor struck in the backyard. It was probably in the water. And the ideas for pirate adventure games came out of. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, and I played, I, I played those games, and then I went to college. I came out back and I applied at Lucas, and I hadn't played any of Lucas's games since the earlier, you know, Ball Blazer and stuff. I hadn't played. So for my interview, I went to, I was so poor, I went to the store and I bought Zach McCracken and the Alien Mind Bitters. I played it all weekend before my interview. And then I had my interview and then I, I returned it to the store. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then for my second interview, I got a free copy of uh, Indiana Jones 3. I played that. The graphic adventure? I had to go borrow a PC at the computer store I used to work at during the summer and play it in the store while people were shopping for computer parts. I was like playing, mm -hmm. seeing how far I could get before my interview with Steve Arnold. I think with adventure games, I was probably more in love with the design process than the actual games themselves. Okay, are, they, are adventure games more fun to make or play? I think they're more fun to make <laughs> than to play. I just, I love crafting the puzzles. I love mm -hmm. figuring out all the puzzles that go together and then weaving those around the stories that go into them. That's kind of what I really enjoy about adventure games. Is that fair? But it's hard for me to play <laughs> adventure games, though, because I play adventure games and I just... All I all I do is I just see problems. Mm -hmm. Like what are the worst? I mean, problems? even even what really are the most egregious ones? common problems adventure games would have? Well, I think there's a there's a couple of things. There's you know backwards puzzles. You know, and that's where, where you like see the you're, ladder. You're, you're kind of given the key before mm -hmm. you see the locked door. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that really bugs me about adventure games. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really bugs me is just completely ridiculous solutions that you only would have discovered through trial and error. They didn't think of 
the solution you thought of, mm -hmm. but it's a completely logical solution that you came right. up with, where it's just a different order of operations. Like you put the hat on before you open the door, and that doesn't solve the puzzle that's solved by you opening the door and putting the hat on. Right. And those kind of, you know, we're always trying to like capture all the possible solutions, which I think are, it's only possible by watching people play the game and, and mm -hmm. like play testing it. You know, like yeah. you'll never be able to think of every single possible solution to a puzzle. You know, the play testing part is a really important part of adventure games because you do learn so much just from watching, you know, watching people play the games. I remember watching people playing our first draft of Monkey Island. Mm -hmm. I learned that more than three lines of dialogue in a row was a bad <laughs> idea because people started, they're, they're mousing around, they start going like this on their mouse and then clicking. <laughs> well, your dialogue. My dialogue, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, not the really good, <laughs> high quality stuff. Um, and I warn you about this question because how you answer it might get you hate mail. Okay. Why did adventure games die? Well, I don't think they ever died. Yeah. I, think, I think today adventure games are as popular as they were back when Monkey Island came out. The problem is that all these other games have become a lot more popular. <laughs> when Monkey Island <coughs> came out, selling 200,000 copies of an adventure yeah. game was huge. Doing that was really, a big yeah, goal. Like that was, that was huge. Was our goal. And I think you'd still sell 100 or 200,000 copies of an adventure game today. The problem is Call of Duty sells 6 and 7 million yeah. copies. Yeah, so I think they're still very popular. It's just that they haven't kept pace with uh, you know, other games out there. Uh, a lot of things that used to be really unique to adventure games, like story and like ambiance. Like we think adventure games more, more than like an action game would really stress, you know, immersion in the fantasy world and character and stuff like that and dialogue, especially funny dialogue. A lot of, some of those things have been incorporated into like almost all games now. Are games like modern games, like would you call games like uh, L.A. Noir an adventure game? I wouldn't call those adventure games. A lot of people do call them adventure games. You even a game like Limbo, which uh -huh. I like a lot. I don't know that I would sort of call that. They kind of like an pigeonhole and they're like chopping up games into categories. They'll put that under adventure because you right. go on an adventure, but it's not. It's not really an adventure game. I mean, to me, an adventure game isn't about going on an adventure. I mean, sometimes adventure games are really not about going on an adventure, but it's about, it's about that puzzle solving. It's about kind of intellectually working your way through, through the game. Don't you do that in Limbo? You kind of work through puzzle. Yeah, but it's, I don't know, it's different. I mean, I don't know why I don't consider Limbo an adventure game, but I just, I just don't. I'd probably, I mean, I think it's a gray area. Well, it's like a Limbo joke, because it's like <laughs> black and white. Um, <laughs> Because you are solving puzzles, it's structured so different than a normal adventure game, which is, has a lot of purposeful backtracking and mm -hmm. navigation and exploration, like nonlinear exploration. Right. Like, but I wonder, is, is, that, is that one of the reasons adventure games have lost popularity? Do people... do they people they didn't lose. Well, the, okay, it? that they're not gaining popularity in pace with everything else. Is, is it that modern gamers don't have the patience for adventure games? Because to me, one of the great things about adventure games is when I'm playing a really good adventure game, it's really about this quiet contemplation. Uh -huh. It's about me sitting at the computer having fun thinking uh -huh. about this, this game. Uh -huh. And uh, I think a lot of uh, adventure game puzzle solving happens at, when you're not at the computer. You're trying to figure out what this puzzle is, and then you're riding the bus to work, or you're you know, riding in your car, and then these things kind of pop in your head. It's like, aha, and then you can't wait to get home and be able to try that solution out. And that's, that's kind of a different mentality for playing games than I think a lot of people have. And I, and I wonder if that's one of the reasons that they're not, not as popular, because well, people just don't enjoy that as much. In most development environments, or when you're talking to a publisher about it, there, it's. Um it's not considered okay to be stuck like that mm -hmm. anymore. Right. And that was the act of playing adventure games. Often you were stuck, and sometimes you just walk around, and it could be really frustrating. Mm -hmm. But you'd often have that thing you're talking about, where you you um, changed your 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 state of mind by going and, and taking a shower, or going to sleep, mm -hmm. or you know, going for a walk. Right, right. But but I think that's an important point, though. I think it's one of the things that makes adventure games uh, a good adventure game good is that there isn't just one puzzle to solve at any given time. Uh -huh. uh, you know, if you're playing Limbo and you're stuck, you're stuck. Uh -huh. But you know, playing Monkey Island, there were you know, hopefully two or three puzzles that you could be working on at any one moment. So if you were stuck trying to you know, figure out how to get past the poodles, there was something else that you could be working on to kind of get your mind out of that, 
uh, that specific puzzle. Or even like, or in a game like Zelda, where you can get stuck playing Zelda, but you can also go do other things like hunt for ghosts and put them in jars or right. trade masks mm -hmm. or something that, d that keeps you from putting um, the game down. Because once you put a game down, especially nowadays, there's so many games mm -hmm. to play. Like during, when we were making adventure games, you'd often have just one game at a time for months on end, you know. And um, now there's like so many games coming out all the time that if I put down a game, it's really unlikely I'll pick it back up again. Yeah, can I go back to And it? I always say I'm going to go back to it, but I never go back to it. You know, when we were making Psychonauts, when first it was had a lot of um, things from adventure games in it and, and a lot of things from platformers in it. And we were just testing out the Black Velvet level in, in, in Psychonauts. And there's this, there's this inventory puzzle. Like, we had an inventory in it to make it like an adventure game. And, and you got these paintings, and they're magic paintings, and you hang them up on hooks, and they would come to life and become whatever the painting was. So like a picture of a guitar would become a giant guitar that you climb up on, like a ladder. And these vines would grow and become like a, a thing, a trellis you could climb on. And we first tested that up with the publisher. There were, um, when feedback came back, it's like, well, people like the level, um, but I don't think the paintings are working. And we're like, oh, what happened? And they're like, um, did people just never, they never figure that out? And they're like, oh, no, they figured it out eventually. But there was a period where they just didn't, they were confused and they didn't know mm -hmm. what to do. And then they figured it out. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, isn't that game, isn't that a, kind of what we used to call gameplay? Mm -hmm. Being confused, not knowing what to do, and then going, aha, and figuring it out and moving forward. It definitely seems like a, like, um, a gameplay fault now if the players are like, ah, I don't know what to do. But I think it's a really fine line between entertaining confusion and non-entertaining confusion. But there's this way of like, um, when you're telling a riddle to somebody and they're, and they're almost getting it, you're kind of, you're almost winking at them like, oh, you almost got it. You're really close. Think about the, you know, you're giving them these hints. And it's this kind of entertainment where you feel like you're really close to figuring out something. But when you have that feeling of like, you have no idea even where to go or what to do, I think that's not entertaining. At right. all. So and and you know, we did a lot of that stuff in Monkey Island because you would go back and talk to people, and there were uh -huh. people would give you successfully more, you know, hints on things. And I, I think that's just part of good design. Uh -huh. And I think when somebody does solve the puzzle that they had a lot of trouble on, they should they should feel like that it was a fair puzzle, that it wasn't that uh -huh. wasn't an unfair like, oh, puzzle. I should have got that. Yeah, they, exactly. I mean, that's the feeling they should have is, oh, I should have got, I should have figured that out myself. Uh -huh. But, but I, giving hints is, is something that, I think like a modern adventure game, giving hints is something that, that they could probably do well without it being a hint system, uh -huh. you know, something that just popped up stuff on the screen, but gave maybe a little more hints through the progression of the game. Because so. I remember when I was playing the Indiana Jones games, I really enjoyed the first half of them, and I got stuck. The first time I really, really got stuck, I didn't know what to do, and I looked in that hint book where you had to put the red <clears throat> plastic on top to see the hint. And then as soon as I did that, I saw that puzzle. And the next time I got stuck, the second I got stuck, I used the hint book again. Mm. So you like, and then I was enjoying the game less because I was just, as soon as I got stuck, I would go and look at the hint. And right. then it was more like the puzzles just became these like tedious blocks instead of. But isn't that really the problem we face today with the, with the internet? <laughs> because when we invented when, the internet, we well, yeah. That. When the, I mean, the internet is this 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 always available hint book, and and I I find I do that myself when I play games. Uh -huh. If I get stuck for <clears throat> longer than a few minutes, I I go over to the internet and and look stuff up. Is that does that take some of the enjoyment out of the game? Like you said know. with the hint book, I don't know. Maybe that's something that actually help adventures nowadays. Is that you don't have that fear of that I might not be able to finish this game. I like, I bought stupid. this game, and there's a chance I might not be able to finish it. This guy thinks it's scary for some people, but knowing that they can always get through it if they need to, maybe that will help. So about uh, how uh, modern games have taken a lot of stuff that used to be exclusive to adventure games, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything they haven't? Is there anything left behind that adventure games used to be really good at that good, modern games haven't Good dialogue. Taken? It's good dialogue. That's, that's always a tricky I, question. I, I really, <clears throat> it's, it's hard for me to mention a game that I've, Played that I just thought the dialogue was just really spot on like and good and funny and it's it is really rare and I'm always it is a little awkward because modern it's, game modern it's discussed <laughs> it's discussed often how a game has great dialogue or how dialogue has gotten really better and to me when I look at even the modern games that are supposed to have really great dialogue and they just don't to me mm -hmm. um, yeah it's the same thing I think there's a real trick to writing interactive dialogue I think it's something that people that it's a lot of screenwriters come from you know, writing movies to writing games, but they don't really understand what it's like to write interactive dialogue. Uh -huh. It's like to me, interactive uh, dialogue is not writing cutscenes, uh -huh. right? And that's just writing a scene of a movie. But but to me, true, really good interactive dialogue are like the dialogues in Monkey Island, that that you're actually interacting 
with these characters and these dialogue. You know, we call them dialogue puzzles, but not really dialogue. You know, they're not really puzzles per se, but that, that you are interacting with these people and you feel like you're having a conversation with them and you're, you're getting funny responses from them. And, and you know, with, with the dialogue, you know, in Monkey Island, I mean, the one of the things that's really important to me about that is that when, you know, the character would say something and then it was time for Guybrush to respond, that we would put up four lines and we got this opportunity to quickly tell four jokes. Uh -huh. Because people would read those four lines and they could laugh at all four of the lines. And they know they even sometimes funny. the choice was meaningless. Yeah. But they would. Yeah. It was, a, it was an opportunity for humor and then you'd move on. Yeah, it's an easy opportunity for humor. But I think one of the reasons that it doesn't work or is considered to not work in games these days is that most games aren't funny. Mm -hmm. Like most games aren't using that as a device to deliver a bunch of humor at once. But right. they're, and it's, and it's true, in a more serious setting, having a whole bunch of dialogue choices and repeating dialogue would not be as fun, but I think it works for comedy games. Well, I, mean, I used that exact same Monkey Island system for Death Bank, and I think that that worked, I think that worked really well. I think, I, have, I don't know if it's fair, but I have a little bit of a, a snobbery about, I feel, I feel like dialogue, people who write dialogue for games should be programmers, or should have programmed <laughs> it at one point yeah. in their life. Because I think the act of wiring up dialogue and making and programming it, making it function in a game, Iterating and then playing it, and then and then seeing what's working and not working, mm -hmm. and having the choice of either changing the dialogue or changing the code, and and wrestling that with just within your own mind, I think is really important. Because then yeah. you start to learn to write better dialogue, and you learn to write better code, to to, to make it work. Because sometimes you never know which is going to make the dialogue better. Yeah, I think interactive, true interactive dialogue is part programming. It really is. Cause, yeah, because the logic of the conversation is procedurally generated. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to question two. What is your favorite adventure game puzzle? In, in any game or, or one that I did? I didn't ask this question. Oh, I did. You did. You yeah. just asked it. You wrote it. We have it on tape. I think my favorite adventure game puzzle in Monkey Island, anyway, is the one with, with the grog, where you had to get the grog to dissolve the oh. cell door that Otis is in, and you had oh. to transfer it between... Uh, between the melting um, grog mm -hmm. cups. I like that puzzle because a lot of times when you're putting something in your inventory, you kind of forget it at that point. You would put the grog in these mugs, and as you played the game, in the inventory, the, the grog cups were melting, and you had to then transfer it uh, to another cup in order to get it. And that's why I like that puzzle. It's kind of a unique puzzle. Like, I haven't seen that used too many times. Yeah, I, I figured that every adventure game would have a grog transferring <laughs> mug puzzle after that. If there's anything you like um, that people have done since you guys kind of stopped making adventure games? I mean, there really isn't, like... though. There really isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's going to be hard for Ron because Ron, Ron hates all modern <laughs> games. I did think that um, adventure games had an accessibility problem. Like in Final Fantasy VII, I remember you just pushing against the door and it opened and you walked through it. And it was like, that was so easy and fast. In an adventure game, you had to walk up and like, click on like open door and you can go through. But um, maybe that just gave you the time to think to solve puzzles. But some of that stuff gets streamlined away from modern adventure games. Doing a point-and-click adventure game today, I, mm -hmm. I would not require players to go down and select open or go down and select <laughs> the door. Some of that can be streamed away without, without uh, detracting from, I think, the core of what makes the adventure game fun. I think with, with a game like Limbo, even though I don't know if I consider Limbo an adventure game per se, but, but one of the things that Limbo did really well is they did keep you focused. And you can tell they did a lot of playtesting and tuning because right at the point where you're about to give up on every puzzle, I'd always figure out the solution. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's, it's risky because there's only one puzzle to solve. But, but it's also a little easier because there is only one puzzle to solve, yeah. right? You can tune everything to that one, moment, uh, that one puzzle at that one moment in the game. So there's a lot of the interest that people have today in adventure games. Is that more, do you think that's more nostalgia based? Because there are a lot of people who love adventure games. Mm -hmm. But do they love the nostalgia of them as opposed to the actual adventure games? Well, some people don't like some of the complexities we've been added to games. I think they don't necessarily want to think about navigating a 3D camera with their right thumb. Mm -hmm. You know, they they, um, they may not want to worry about survival and um, they I, I, like. Okay, the last one I played was Mechanarium, and the, I guess the things I really liked about it was just the the beauty of the art, like just the painting, which you don't often see in like, I mean, they're beautiful 3D games, but the way that it was like mm -hmm. a handcrafted, you know, background painting by, you know, and I don't know if that's something that you have to be an adventure game to have, but. Um, and I would consider that an adventure game. Yeah. Just talking about, you know, what games are adventure games or whatnot. I do yeah. think that that's an adventure game. 
little thought balloons with little flashbacks. Mm -hmm. Instead of cutscenes, they were like right. him just thinking about robots beating him up. It was really, right. um, really funny. Well, I know one thing I would never do in an adventure game if I was going to make a new one. Uh -huh. If I was going to make a new one, uh -huh. pixel hunting with the cursor. Um, that was a really bad thing that we did. Was that done on purpose? No, I don't think it was done on purpose. It was just <laughs> it was just something you did. We didn't really think about it necessarily as a good thing or a bad thing. Uh -huh. But just waving the cursor over the screen from top to bottom to see that four by four pixel area that lit up. I did a pixel hunting puzzle on accident in full throttle, which is I thought it was Ben's trying to break in the back of his factory, but he um, mm -hmm. he knows there's a special spot on the wall to kick to open mm -hmm. the door. But it wasn't supposed to be that you kicked every spot on the floor. It was that you remember that the person who told you that um, where to go was younger when she broke in, and so you're at a lower point in the wall, and you kick, and I, you know, and I, it, people, when most people play it, what they do is kick every single brick on the back <laughs> wall. Ah, uh, it's my fault. So what's your favorite part of making an adventure game? I love brainstorming puzzles, you know, sitting in a room and just kind of thinking through the, both the character and the story and the puzzles at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you kind of think about, you know, your character has um, a goal, something they want, so you're both thinking of obstacles and way to circumvent the obstacles at the same time. And the conversations are always pretty loose because you can't, it seems like mentally if you go like, okay, you know, you really try and like, we need a way to break through a door, not using a key. How do you do it? Like you get so focused that you just can't think of anything. It's almost like the same, pro similar process to playing an adventure game where you have to distract your, your mind. Sometimes you, do it, yeah. you get so locked in trying to find the solution, you can't find it and you need to like think about something else and then out of your, your peripheral vision comes the solution to the puzzle that you're trying to design. And so I like, I like designing those. I like working with artists and animators, and um, I liked um, I liked back in the old days using a system like Scum, which was you know our our, our um, scripting language for making the games, because I could do the work my meaningful programming work myself, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I can't do anymore. <laughs> but I could, I could go and like make a room happen. I could wire the doors up and the windows right. and everything, and and because then you could really craft something and like and change it and polish it all by yourself and you could stay there all night long trying to make it so that exactly when you step on this one creaky spot in the floor that the pigeon turns around and like that's the dumbest example I can think of creaky pigeons but you know what I'm saying <laughs> I think that goes back to the you know the argument that we still have today about whether designers should be programmers and I think they absolutely should because oh. part of doing really good design is being able to iterate on things and try, quickly try things out to make sure that things you know, feel right. But if you have the right tools, you don't have to be a programmer. If you have the well, ability a, to change things. You don't have to be like a C++ programmer, but, yeah. but there is a kind of this ability to wire things up in whatever, you know, whether you're doing in Lua or Scum or some visual tool. Just that ability to go in and manipulate things and try things out very quickly as opposed to just writing it down on paper and then having other people implement it, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. How are we going to make this game? Not that much money. We don't have scum. Is that an actual question? Can we steal scum? <laughs> 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 we used to have this whole system to make games really fast, so we either have to make it again from scratch mm -hmm. for no money and no time, or we could use an existing graphic adventure engine that's out there. I think we should do that. I think we should use an existing graphics adventure engine to do it for that exact reason, is that we, we can't spend a lot of time developing the technology. And there are some really good graphic adventure engines mm -hmm. out there. So I think we should you know, do a little bit of research, find a really good one, and then just embrace that and use that engine to build the game. It would be really neat if it came with a, a, ship, a scripting language that I could actually use again. I think for the budget that uh, we're talking about, I'm going to have to do programming. You're doing all the programming. <laughs> <laughs> this could be exciting. <laughs> for some reason, it seems like it's easier to do playtesting. I don't know. We did playtesting back then, but it was we were much more isolated. On the original Maniac Mansion, we had two testers. Uh, one was a guy that worked in the office, and the other person that tested the game was my uncle. <laughs> and I would, I would physically mail him floppy disks every week mm -hmm. of the build of the game. Mm -hmm. At least now, if you need uh, some kind of testing, you know, we can deliver things digitally over the internet to people. We're getting to the point where we can, I think we can really service niche markets now. Things don't have to be just completely mass market. But you can say, you know what, there's this small group of people, but that yeah. small group of people is still half a million. Mm -hmm. And we can service those those niche markets. I think 
traditional adventure games will probably always be serving a niche market, but hopefully it's a big enough niche market that it's still interesting. And that's the thing, the internet has enabled a lot of uh, spread out people with, um, with uh, unusual interest to get together and kind of make a community mm -hmm. online, and that makes it easier to make something for them that will reach a lot of people. Um, but maybe that niche market is also regular people. That's the thing is that mm -hmm. we used to, I remember, have this feeling of um, we're trying to make games for regular people. Adventure games would touch on themes like romantic themes, comedy, things that are not often touched on by games. Like games are still mostly stuck in summer blockbuster action movie kind right. of mode. And adventure games would talk about themes that were broader and about uh, human, the human experience in, in, in a way, a, a little bit. But I think one of the reasons they can do that is because they are a little more slow moving. Mm -hmm. And that could be an advantage for a lot of people because sitting somebody down that does not have a lot of exposure to games in front of an Xbox and having all these things coming at them and having to make quick reaction decisions, that really does narrow your audience down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But adventure games are very slow moving. You can take as much time as you need to solve things. There aren't timers ticking all the time. And that could broaden them into that more kind of mass normal, I don't want to say normal, that sounds bad. I'll say normal. Normal. Normal, normal people, people type type playing those <laughs> things. When I was doing the uh, adventure games at Humongous Entertainment, which were true adventure games but for kids, we found that a lot of parents played those games. When their kids weren't even there, when their kids were off in bed, they continued to play Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish because it was a game, it was a thing that they really enjoyed and it was something that they they could do without you know, feeling like there was this kind of action that they had to do, but it was slow, and they really enjoyed those a lot. It sounds dirty when you say it that way. Kids, we were just playing putt-putt. <laughs> <laughs> those noises you heard when we were asleep. <laughs> Mom and Dad were just playing putt-putt. <laughs> um, so what about game length? Because Monkey Island, at the time, 40 hours was what we shot for. We always just said that. We, we always said, said 40 hours of gameplay because it felt right. like 40 hours of gameplay. But we would, we would put puzzles into those games just to stretch the time out because gamers expected 40 hours of gameplay. Yeah. And I mean, other than some very hardcore RPGs these days, nobody expects 40 hours of gameplay. I calculated when we started Grim Fandango because Full Throttle, the game before, had been um, criticized for being too short because we went really big with the production and we had to cut like a third of it out. So it was really short and so I sat there and I, I, calc I counted the number of puzzles, and there are 20 puzzles in the game, and real puzzles. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, we need at least twice that. So like, I, was, I was like, okay, 40 puzzles. And each one has to provide like 15 minutes of, of entertainment. 40 puzzles. 40 puzzles, that's fine. You can do that. I think shorter is better. I, I, I really do think a shorter experience that's more focused is actually yeah. gonna be a lot better than drawing something out. I mean, I wish people would, would, would look at games a little bit more like they look at other entertainment. Because if you go to a movie, it lasts two hours, and you're going to spend close to $20 to go to that movie. You're going to mm -hmm. spend 12 or $14 for the ticket, you know, plus the overpriced popcorn. And yet, when people buy a game and it lasts for four hours, like, say, Limbo, but they only spent $14 on it, I mean, that's twice as much as they're getting out of a movie. I, I wish that was embraced more because I think we could do a lot more interesting focused experiences if we really could push the time down to something where we weren't just filling and drawing stuff out. All right, so how are we gonna draw this out? So 30 minutes is what I think this game 30, should be. 30 minutes. Amazing minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. 30 of the best minutes. I'm trying <laughs> to remember the scope of the old, do you remember the budget of Monkey Island? Yes, I do. How much is that? $130,000. Oh, Jesus. $130,000. Adjusted for inflation, that's probably more than we're asking for here. Yeah, because we all made crap. How many action. rooms did Monkey Island have? Like, we called everything a room. Like, a, the one art file that represented right, an avenue room. space. And that was a holdover from Maniac Mansion. Yeah, because they were actually right. rooms. Because Scum called them rooms. Well, that was like, it seemed rooms. like they were always 100 because 100 was like a yeah, 100, hard limit in the engine. 100 for a while, is what we, it? yeah, 99. So, um,. Let's calculate, like, can we make 100 rooms? Like, I'm gonna do this again. I think it's like 20 rooms. I think we should shoot for, for 20 rooms. 20, are you still gonna have rooms? Well, screens, whatever. Yeah, 2D or 3D. Whatever the kids are calling them these days. <laughs>
I mean, one of the reasons I was excited about making an adventure game is working with um, Nathan Stapley, who's an artist who um, has a great painting style. And then one of the things I missed about the 2D graphic adventures is that you would be able to have a great artist um, expressing themselves directly onto the screen, right. not going mm -hmm. through 3D shaders or any of the complicated technology that um, would change or alter their, you know, the vision for what it should look like. So I do like the idea of actually hand-painted backgrounds, and, um, and then it's just a question of should the characters also be hand-painted and animated? or I think it should be all 2D. All 2D. Old school. Have to look this up. Mm -hmm. Old school. <laughs> I just think it's a lot more interesting than, mm -hmm. than 3D. 3D does buy you a lot, mm -hmm. but I think for a project like this, just doing something that really emphasizes the art from the artist, I mm -hmm. think 2D really would really get us that. When's our last chance to make a shooter? We could change right now. We could reshoot some important things in that pitch with, video. With really funny dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> what so about okay. music? What? What about music? What would you do for music? Steel music? Hum it? I can hum it. Guess it's free off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we could crowdsource the music. That's scary. Wait, can we trick the backers into making the entire game for us? Yeah, you submit art, submit some code. This could be like the, uh, the magic soup stone. Right. Where you're like, I got the soup, I got the stone right. that will make soup for you. All I need to add is boiling water and maybe a carrot and maybe a little bit of potatoes and some meat. And we're and done. And take the stone out. And we're done. And we're the stone. <laughs> we're like the stone who's just, we're just, it's totally a fraud. That's brilliant. <laughs> Probably don't want to use the word fraud in this pitch. Uh, yeah, I'm just I, when, when I say fraud, I meant opportunity. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's not what it appears to be. <laughs> the interesting thing about this project is that we really don't know a lot of things at the very beginning, like how things are going to go like how we're going to handle input and let people actually contribute to the game. But I think we should take a lot of contributions from people and give people a lot of opportunity to give feedback on things. Because right. that is part of the process. There, there is that kind of sausage factory part of making games. <laughs> I think of a new metaphor. <clears throat> Chocolate factory just sounds too delicious. I don't think that's a good metaphor. Chocolate is not hard to watch, but you don't want to know about all the things that fall into it on accident. Yeah. <laughs> um, wait, what's this question? Who's the most famous person you know that plays point-and-click graphic adventures? I don't know. I was just thinking up questions because somebody had to be prepared. I, um, I do know one. Okay. Elijah Wood. Really? In, in uh, Entertainment Weekly, he said, what was your favorite video game? And he said, Monkey Island. Really? Well, I was told. Someone told me that. I know Steven Spielberg <laughs> played adventure games a lot. So who's more famous, Steven Spielberg or Elijah Wood? Wow. It's heavy. We don't want to talk about potential rewards here, do we? Or do we? Like things that we can give away for certain donations. There's obviously like, the game at the end, or be a character in the game. Mm -hmm. That might be crazy. We could have people drop by. They show up at the door and they have to show their little card mm -hmm. that proves their contribution level. But we set tape down depending on how much they back the project. So mm -hmm. some people can only go 40 feet into the <laughs> office, and some people go all the way to the kitchen where the free soda is. But it costs like $8,000 to get back there. And some people will make them dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait, you make them dinner? Yeah, I'll just What's your, I'll what's your best dinner. dish that you I'll make? make them dinner. Uh, Osobuku. I make a really good Osobuku. Osobuku. What is Osobuku? Is that a game? Braised, uh, you know, like lamb shank. All right, braised lamb shank, $5,000. <laughs> Ron Gilbert will make you Osobuku. <laughs> I mean, it would be interesting to see, because people are always saying they want these kind of games, and this is kind of a, a referendum on that. To like, it's like... To help they, help they, save adventure games. Oh, that sounds, so, that sounds like such so victim-y, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> okay, put up or shut up. Take okay. your pick. <laughs> so your two choices. Those are your two modes. <laughs> Victim or really hostile. <laughs> I hope this works out because it is kind of a game like we, that we haven't really been able to make happen for business reasons for like many, many years because of current market. What was the phrase I always use? Market conditions. Current market realities when they cancel adventure games. <laughs> or we'll just prove all those publishers right. We'll just prove them all right. <laughs>